This is the newsroom for Friday, June 4, 2021. We're broadcasting to you on E1, Scar TV, NTN, and Tarzi TV in Bartica. In the headlines, GWI is probing reckless spending and poor financial management at the entity, which reportedly occurred in the past five years. So who is calling? And where a forensic audit is being conducted. More than 5,000 Guyanese have already applied for house lots for this year, and 75% of them are among the youth population. The government will be spending $200 million to construct 50 core houses in Sofia. And in sport, Guyana Jaguars resume training despite uncertainty over regional tournament, and the world number one test all-rounder Jason Holder looking forward to South Africa challenge. With the news, I'm Kurt Campbell. We're glad you can join us. First up, a sitting of the National Assembly has been called for next Thursday, June 10, according to a notice paper sent out by the Parliament Office. The sitting is expected to be a private member's sitting. There are several questions from the opposition that have been tabled. These include questions about employees and contract at the Ministry of Housing and Water, the distribution of the COVID-19 cash grant, the allocation of house lots prior to August 2, 2020, infrastructural development in buildings, the formation of the People's Corporate Communications Unit, whether a feasibility study was done for the road linkage from Diamond to Ogle, and the Guyana Online Learning Academy. We tell you now that a forensic audit is being conducted at the Guyana Water Incorporated GWI to investigate reckless spending and poor financial management according to the chief executive officer of the company, Sheikh Bash. The CEO revealed this on Friday during a press conference held virtually. Vishani Raghavir has our story. On Friday, the GWI's chief executive officer, Sheikh Baksh, said that the internal audit of the utility company revealed that there was reckless spending over the past five years. During that time, he said that several expenditures pointed to poor financial management. Four areas where we are investigating and where Soku was called in and where a forensic audit is being conducted as I speak because we have seen the internal auditor report here at GWI. We've looked at it and we have had to move. The first one relates to the sequest. This was a chemical mix, which cost us 1.8 billion over four years. And it relates to important, this mix, dry mix, from a company called AquaSmart in the United States of America, for which the management saw that they need a middleman. They have a middle company doing the procurement, and then mixing, batching the, 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 the product, and transporting it to the regions. So a middleman was there, not directly so sourcing from the, the AquaSmart. And this was so sourcing, breaching all the tender processes, the tender rules, both here at GWI and also um, the procurement, the procurement board the central, the national procurement board. So what we have found, the internal auditor has found, is that there has been double charging in the batching, mixes, and transportation. Huge sums of money are involved here. The CEO also said that other concerns raised after the internal audit include instances of fictitious invoicing, questionable delivery of goods, sole sourcing of chemicals for water treatment, and contract splitting. Baksh lamented that the company was on the verge of collapse following the poor financial management. 2020, before August, the company was on the verge of a collapse if we did not take certain measures. And the mere fact that the company had to go and have an overdraft facility totaling 270 million, which was largely spent to pay the salaries of the staff, attest to what was happening. Any elementary accountant or financial analyst will tell you something is going wrong with the company. And this was the case. Additionally, $800 million was owed 
to suppliers of goods and services. And when I took office, I was bombarded on a daily basis. People crying out for payments. It affected our image, it affected our credit worthiness as a utility. And we had to move quickly and resolve this to the extent that it has been reduced significantly. It's only about two, just over 200 million now that we owe to um, suppliers out there. Since August also, the CEO said that efforts are being made to intensify works to provide better services to residents, including efforts to fix transmission and construct treatment plants in five different locations. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Vishani Ragavir. Police headquarters on Friday said it is beefing up security around gold trading businesses given recent robberies. The police reported that there have been two recent incidents where persons conducting business at establishments dealing with the purchase of gold and other precious metals were attacked and robbed by criminal elements after having completed their transactions. In light of this, and with the view to interdicting the suspects, the Guyana Police Force has increased its visibility around such businesses, police has headquarters stated. The police force is urging citizens to be extra vigilant and security conscious when involved in such business dealings. Guyana's Central Housing and Planning Authority, CHNPA, has seen an influx of house lot applications since the new government assumed office back in August 2020. For 2021 alone, more than 5,000 Guyanese interested in owning their own homes have sent in applications. Of that number, 75% are of the youth population. This was revealed by Minister within the Ministry of Housing and Water, Susan Rodriguez, during an interview with the newsroom on Friday. She said this shows confidence in the government's ability to deliver on its promises. The minister explained too that government's priority was to clear the backlog of 70,000 applications left by the previous administration. In so doing, approximately 4,000 house lot allocations have already been made. So, so far, uh, since we've taken office from August 2020, we have allocated approximately uh, 4,000 house lots. In our first set of allocations, because of the backlog that we've inherited, 70,000 applicants, we thought it would be prudent in our first set of allocations to address the backlog. So we allocated 4,000, um, and this was mainly focused on um, the old applicants, those who um, slipped through the system somehow. So we address those. What we've seen, though, is a rejuvenation of the housing sector. And we see a lot of interest uh, from young people. So for this year alone, just as, as an example, for 2021 alone, we've seen uh, 5,000 new applicants in our system. And 75% um, of that are applicants between the ages of 21 and 39. So we are very encouraged by that. And a large percentage of that is women. So we are very uh, satisfied. Um, it, it's very pleasing because I see that as um, confidence in our administration um, to be able to deliver um, on behalf of young people. Still ahead on the newsroom, the government will be spending $200 million to construct 50 core houses in Sofia. And Guyana is set to get more COVID-19 vaccines from China next month. Thank you watching the newsroom. E-Networks has handed over a check valued $1 million to the Civil Defense Commission, CDC, to support flood relief efforts countrywide. The check was handed over to the CDC's Deputy Director General, Major Loring Benans, at the Commission's Thomas Road headquarters on Friday by E-Networks Representative Ashley John. The Deputy Director expressed thanks for the timely contribution. Days after confirming that Guyana made a down payment for 150,000 doses of the single-dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine through the African Union, Minister of Health Dr. Frank Anthony has said that more of the Chinese Sinopharm COVID-19 vaccines are expected this month. He did not state how many doses are expected, nor the cost of these vaccines. We are working to get uh, vaccine supplies. As you know, uh, we are expecting another shipment of uh, Sputnik V vaccines. 
uh, those should be coming in uh, soon. And um, we have, as you, I would have told you before, uh, we have paid to the African Union um, the monies that have been required for the J&J &J vaccines. So we're expecting those to also come in sometime during this month. Uh, we are expecting a shipment of AstraZeneca vaccines from COVAX, and again, those should come sometime during this month. And we are also expecting um, some additional Sinopharm vaccines, which again would be coming in this month. So we have an, uh, vaccines from multiple sources uh, that would be coming in uh, at different points during the month. So as we have said before, we have enough vaccines for the adult population of Guyana. And we, are, we hope that people would come out and get their vaccine, vaccines as quickly as possible so that we can all work to achieve herd immunity. Already, Barbados, India and China made donations to Guyana while the country has purchased the Sputnik V vaccines from Russia. The country also received a consignment of vaccines through the World Health Organization COVAX facility. Sophia is set for major development with the Central Housing and Planning Authority setting aside $200 million for the construction of 50 core homes under the Ministry's Adequate Housing and Urban Accessibility Program, according to the Minister of Housing and Water, Colin Crowell. And with US $10 million allocated under the program, the minister announced that more than 100 persons will receive a total of $59.5 million in home improvement subsidies. It was during the sad turning ceremony for the construction of a 51 million multi-purpose facility at Seafield Sophia on Thursday that Minister Colin Kroll made the announcement. He explained too that the housing ministry aims to consolidate the existing schemes and that funds have been allocated to finance the livelihood restoration plan. As a result, 20 people from the community have qualified for cash entitlements three for cash crops and 17 for income allowances. There are 50 persons from Sophia who will be selected to receive core homes. That's an investment of $200 million. 119 persons will receive home improvement subsidies. That's an investment of $59,500,000. But wait, there's more. As we move towards consolidating ex existing schemes, we have allocated monies to finance livelihood restoration plan, which will address displacement and it relates to impacts associated with project work right here in Sophia. Further, the housing minister also revealed that four mobile units were distributed to residents whose business operations were dismantled or relocated to facilitate infrastructural works under the various projects being implemented in the community. For all of these activities, we consulted over 900 residents from Sophia. So as we wanted to finally align our program with the needs of the community, these consultations have led to about 75 residents being employed directly with the project since it has started. As we seek to enhance the capacity of communities, we have ensured that 30% of the labor required for any project must come from the community itself. The, inv the involvement of residents is important to all of us. The Adequate Housing and Urban Accessibility Program was designed to improve housing conditions and access to critical infrastructure, enhance mobility and safety, and strengthen the capacity to operate and maintain urban services. For the newsroom, I am Shikima Day. The upgraded equipment for ExxonMobil's flash gas compressor system, which was first damaged in January this year, is currently being reinstalled offshore Guyana. Vishani Ragabir tells us more. This flash gas compressor system is a board Eliza Destiny floating production storage and offloading FPSO vessel operating in the Stabrook Block offshore Guyana. 
The flash gas compressor malfunctioned in January, resulting in ExxonMobil's increase in natural gas flaring above pilot levels to maintain safe operations. Subsequently, the faulty flash gas compressor was removed and sent abroad for repairs. In an update to members of the media in May, Public and Government Affairs Advisor at ExxonMobil Guyana, Janelle Prasad, related that repairs and upgrades to the third stage discharge silencer were ongoing. The damaged gas compressor was reinstalled in April, but it was subsequently discovered that there was another problem with the discharge silencer. Resultantly, the oil company significantly reduced its production to just 30,000 barrels. Operations had ramped up back subsequently. The silencer is a key component of the flash gas compression system. In an update provided in May, Persaud said that the repairs were reportedly being progressed by Man Energy Solutions, the equipment's manufacturer, at a facility in Houston, Texas. In that update as well, Persaud also stated that the manufacturer of the redesigned third-stage discharge Venturi has been completed and it was being shipped to Guyana. On Friday, Persaud said that this newly upgraded equipment was currently being reinstalled. The team remains on track to complete reinstallation and startup of the flash gas compressor later this month. We're hoping that this can be done by by the middle of June. Passard also noted that the company continues to safely manage flare levels of the natural gas to less than 15,000 standard cubic feet per day, which is a volume of measurement for gas. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Vishani Ragbir. The country's water utility company was trapped with high employment costs after it hired more than 700 additional workers from 2015 to 2020, Minister of Housing and Water Colin Crowell said Thursday as he sought to explain why the company was forced to cut back on staff. He said the decision to remove more than 100 workers was fully discussed with the union. It was not a fly-by-night decision, Crowell told reporters at the sidelines of an event in Sophia, Georgetown. He also denounced reports that the firings were racially motivated. But what I can answer to is some of the sentiments that they'll be going out there to say that they, they, it is all racially driven. Um, but we have to understand the background of how we have arrived to this point in terms of GWI. In 2015, the staff complement of, of GWI was approximately 600. In 2015, August, when we took over, the staff complement is 1,380. So we're talking about a 700 plus increase of staff, number of staff. You're talking about 125% increase of staff over five years. For which the responsibility of GWI, if you measure the performance, um, and the responsibilities and the mandate, um, it's a similar to when we're taking over. And so obviously there is an overstaff complement. It was something that is, I spoke about it in my last um, budget speech um, about the overstaffed GWI. And uh, of course, this was discussed at the board, and there's a board that GWI falls under. This has been discussed extensively at the board level. This has been discussed with the union and so the methodology for which they've come to, um, it was not something uh, by a fly-by-night. Reiterating the reasoning of GWI's current Chief Executive Officer, Sheikh Bash, Kroll relayed that the company's employment figure had increased from just about 600 in 2015 to more than 1,300 by August 2020. This led to government prompting the much-needed rationalization of employees, which started eight months ago. The GWI CEO also revealed that the company's employment costs had also moved from $96 million in 2015 to $240 million by 2020, representing a staggering 140% increase. The company said that a total of 157 staffers are listed to be sent off. Of that number, 76 employees were already issued termination letters since May 31. The rest will be terminated within a three-month period. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports, along with sport with Avinash Ramzan.
Welcome back to Newsroom. Now for a look at what's happening in sport. We're starting off with some cricket news. Despite a cloud of uncertainty as to when full-fledged senior regional cricket will resume, five-time champions Guyana Jaguars are still steadfast in preparation. With small group sessions now at the National Stadium Providence, head coach Ethan Crandon indicated to Newsroom Sport recently that the focus remains on improving in all areas. Akim Green reports. The COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted the lives of many, and obviously sport has faced the brunt of those disruptions. Now, the Guyana Jaguars squad have been training here at the National Stadium Providence in small numbers as they prepare for regional cricket. However, the difference is this time they do not know when that regional cricket will resume. You know, first of all, I must thank the Ministry of Youth and Sport for giving us the opportunity to train at the stadium. Um, obviously, it's a good idea to, you know, get the guys out back. Uh, we were out for a couple of months um, and we're back out now, um, you know, with full protocol, COVID protocols and guidelines being um, observed. Um, the guys been responding so far with regards to the safety rules and so on. So that's, that's the most important thing for us, um, to get the guys um, observing the rules and, you know, follow the rules and the guidelines and um, try and stay together and keep safe throughout our sessions. Um, we've been focusing on strength and conditioning work and also some basic fielding drills, uh, more on technical stuff, um, throwing and, you know, feeling stuff. So um, that's been going good so far. The response, the response has been really good. Um, we've also assessed the guys on the first first day of uh, returning to training. Uh, next week we're going to um, assess some other guys who's going to start training next week. Um, can't complain at the moment with the level of fitness. I'm satisfied with um, what I've seen. Obviously there's area for imp room for improvement and I uh, know the guys have been pushing hard to get to um, to live the standards and to maintain a decent level of fitness. Yeah, the pandemic has, you know, brought a lot of changes to stuff, to planning, um, organizing and so on. Um, you know, we've witnessed it for over a year and something now. Uh, obviously, it's, it's brought different uh, challenges to the group. Um, but we, we, we understand what it takes. Um, and we also realize that it's important for us to, to stay, to keep in tune, um, to keep our standards high. And every opportunity we get to come out and train and work together, we maintain a high level of fitness, um, we keep the intensity high, and we try to improve our skill on a daily basis. So I think um, it's obviously challenging to have the guys coming out day in, day, in, day out, not having the opportunity to, to play cricket in itself, to play some matches, some competitive games, and so on. Um, but you know, our job is to keep them motivated. And that's, we, that's what we're trying to do. Um, I know we have, we'll have some games coming up soon, probably later on in the month and in the new month coming. And uh, we're working towards that at the moment. Um, some guys would have had the opportunity to go overseas and in the US and play a couple of games, at least they get the opportunity to do that. Some are back already. And we've been following up with those guys to see how they've been progressing, um, you know, and see if it's really, you know, feasible to have them do that. And uh, obviously we will assess that and, and see how it goes and make decision in the future as to if we would continue with that. In May, the Guyana Dragons would have contracted 15 players for this season of regional cricket. Among those 15 are three West Indies players, Kimo Paul, Shimon Hetmeyer and Romayo Shepard. For various reasons, those three would not have been awarded international contract record to West Indies. However, head coach Issa Crandon has insisted that those players have risen the standard of practice with the Guyana Jaguar squad. We're proud and we're really, really happy to have, um, you know, Shepard, Kimo Paul and Etimaya back with us. Um, obviously, we'd love to see them playing representing the West Indies. Uh, but it is what it is at the moment and our job is to get them back there. But I, I know when these guys are back in the, into the setup and, you know, the energy they, they bring here and, you know, the experience they would share with the younger players and so on and the work ethic that other guys would look up to them and, you know, and able to, to follow suit what they're doing and able to pull a lot of stuff from them. So having them here it, in itself, it lifts the spirit and the energy of the, of the players in the setup and it also inspires the other players, you know, to, to get up there and to, to perform well and to get into the West Indies team. Um, Etima is not with us. Um, uh, Shepard and, and Kimo Paul has been very um, good examples so far to the other guys. They came out and they work as hard as the other guys and harder than them as well. So, um, you know, that's good example from those guys. And that's what you want to see from your senior players. And it's only going to get better from, from now onwards. And um, hopefully we can 
you know, we all can inspire the future generation from this, this setup here in Guyana and um, hope to produce more quality players for the West Indies. I think that's the plan is to, um, to start incorporating our young upcoming emerging players into our setup, which we have, you know, done throughout um, since the inception of this professional cricket league. And, um, you know, the, the guys like the Johnsons, the Singh, the Brambles, the Barnwells, those guys would have been around a long time with fast experience and so on. And we don't expect those, those guys to, you know, to play forever and to be around. But it's important that we start, you know, giving these other youngsters opportunities to mix the blend with the youth and the experience together. And we actually have some good youngsters coming through as well, but we need to, um, you know, structure our cricket properly so uh, we can see more, you know, youngsters coming through the, the system, you know, and get exposed to this, um, um, the professional training system that we have here at the moment. So um, I think I'm happy with, with the group that we have, a lot of experience and we have you know, no, no, um, Kevlin Anderson now in, uh, very talented, you all know uh, what he's capable of. Uh, we're very excited to have him among us. Um, we have young Akshaya Pasad, we have young Tim Tevin Imlak, you know, we have some young under 19 players coming through as well. So, um, you know, our job is to just to nurture these young players and to ensure and prepare them well for us class cricket and to the other step into international cricket. So yes, um, we're happy to have this 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 15 that we would have contracted. And we also have players who are not into the 15 that will be considered for, you know, for us class cricket and Liste cricket. Since the inception of the professional cricket league in the Caribbean, the Guyana Jaguars have won five consecutive for their titles. They've only been dethroned in the last season, which was cut short due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, they have not won a Super 50 tournament yet. As you would have heard, Coach Clannan insisted that they must begin to build for the future. Reporting for the news from Providence, and Mark Green. Now, Cricket West Indies selection panel on Friday named this provisional 17-man squad as preparations continue for the upcoming Betway Test Series against South Africa. The squad is expected to be fourth a cut down to an official 13 members on Monday, June 7. Find out who made the cut in this report. Batsmen Shea Hope and Kieran Powell, both of whom were among the runs in the best versus best 40 game this week, have been included. Hope made 79 and 106 for Jermaine Blackwood 11 and Powell scored 22 and 95 for Jamar Hamilton 11, who won the match by three wickets, chasing 311. All round the Ruston Chase, who claimed match figures of 5 for 88 and scored 35 and 45 not out, has also been included while opener John Campbell has been sidelined. Guyanese Niall Smith will remain in St. Lucia to assist with the test squad preparations alongside fellow fast bowlers Keon Harding, Preston McSween and Mark Window Mindley. The provisional squad reads Craig Braffitt captain, Jermaine Blackwood vice captain and Kruma Bonner, Darren Bravo, Rustin Chase, Rakim Cornwall, Joshua De Silva, Shannon Gabriel, Jamar Hamilton, Jason Holder, Shea Hope, Alzari Joseph, Kyle Mayers, Kieran Powell, Kimar Roach, Jaden Seals and Jamel Warrikan. Fast bowler Chamar Holder was unavailable due to injury, while 19-year-old fast bowler Jaden Seals is a first-time inclusion in the West Indies provisional squad for a test series. The two-match Betway test series will be played at the Darren Sami Cricket Ground for the Sir Vivian Richards Trophy on June 10-14 and June 18-22. These are the final matches in the current cycle of the ICC World Test Championship, with both teams trying to finish higher in the final championship table. Meanwhile, world number one test all rounder Jason Holder is eagerly looking forward to the challenge of facing South Africa in two test matches in the Caribbean, the first of which starts on June 10 in St. Lucia. Holder, who was recently relieved of the test captaincy, said the series is an important one for the Caribbean side, having come off positive results in the last two series against Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. In an interview with CWI Media, Holder said a team that bats best will win the series. He also touched on his role as a player in the West Indies side. One of the things that you know, I pray myself on doing is enjoying what I'm doing and I make sure I contribute positively, positively in, you know, in each facet of the game. Um, you know, obviously I'm on our own and, and I'm asked to make runs and, and take wickets. So for me, it's whatever I can do to help the team win cricket games. And um, yeah, this series is a very big one and a very important one for us. You know, I think I played against South Africa in my second and third test, match, test matches and um, it was done in, in South Africa last time and we haven't played them since then. So. I'm really looking forward to this series. It's obviously a big series for us. South Africa is a very, very good cricket side. And we're looking forward to it. And I'm personally looking forward to the challenge. I still feel very, very fit and, and healthy. Um, mentally, I'm in a really good place. You know, it's good to have a couple of weeks off after, 
in our long intense year of, uh, of international cricket and obviously if, if you look down to the calendar this year you know, it's pretty intense as, as well so yeah I'm feel, feeling good you know I'm still very very positive and optimistic about my future in West Indies cricket and you know hopefully I can contribute positively and, and help us to win a few more trophies. I think it will be a hard fought series you know I think South Africa is in a transitionary phase where you know their bone attack is very very solid but you know they've left uh, a big hole. AB de Villiers, Hashim Amla, um, Faf de Plissy have probably left a big hole in their experience batting lineup. You know, so they've got a few youngsters coming in trying to make their mark as well. And likewise with us, you know. So I think this series will be probably won by the team who puts puts the puts the runs on the board. You know, I think both bowling attacks are very very solid. Um, our bowling attack um, in the Caribbean has proven to be one of the best bowling attacks, and you know South Africa's bowling attack with. Anrich Nokia, you know, Rabada, you know, uh, Engidi, just to name a few. Okay. Uh, Maharaj as well, too, does, does a really outstanding job for them. So it, it pretty much balances, up, balances off itself in terms of the bowling lineups. So my take is that, you know, this series will be won by the team who makes most, the most runs. Thanks, Jess. Cheers. The Ghana Cricket Board's inaugural on the 1950 over franchise tournament has been postponed until further notice. In a statement, the board said the current inclement weather is severely affecting the game and denying players the opportunity to showcase their talents. The board said it is committed to completing the tournament as soon as the weather conditions consistently become more suitable for play. The tournament, which is being held in partnership with General Marine, Tropical Spring, 4-Hour Bearings and Trophy Stall, started last weekend at the National Stadium Providence, but both matches were severely affected by rain. And no play was possible on the third day of the first test between England and New Zealand at Lords. Rain fell throughout the day, with umpires calling off a halt to proceedings in the afternoon session. The rain has interrupted what is shaping up to be a tight contest, with England 111 for 2 in reply to New Zealand's 378. Better weather is predicted for Saturday and Sunday, the final two days of the match. An extra eight overs can be added to the schedule 90 on each of the remaining days. When play does resume, England will look to eradicate a deficit of 267 runs, with Rory Burns unbeaten on 59 and Joe Root 42 not out. Devon Conway's 200 was the main contribution to the New Zealand total, the left-hander becoming only the seventh man to make a double century on test debut. And reigning NBA champions, the Los Angeles Lakers have suffered a shock first-round playoff defeat to the Phoenix Suns, 113-100. Devon Booker scored 47 points for the Suns as they sealed a 4-2 series win. LeBron James scored 29 points for the Lakers, who are the first defending champions to lose at this stage since the San Antonio Spurs in 2015. The result also marks the first time that James was lost, has lost that should be, in the first round of the playoff. The Suns will now face the Denver Nuggets in the Western Conference semifinals after they clinched a 4-2 series win over the Portland Trail Blazers. The Nuggets won 126-115 to condemn Blazers to a fourth first round defeat in five seasons. And with that, we've come to the end of the news for this evening. Of course, you can find updates on these and other stories on our website, newsroom.gy, our Facebook page and Instagram. On behalf of the entire news and technical team, I'm Avanash Ramzan, encouraging you to get vaccinated. Have a great weekend. See you back here on Monday.